Hello. Um, I have the pleasure today, I'm Mark, I have the pleasure today to introduce you to Elizabeth, um, to learn about her spiritual journey. <laughs> now, I've had the pleasure of spending, you know, a bit of time, maybe more than most in the room, um, <laughs> with Betsy for her journey. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that as as I consider um, our, you know, decades or so together, um, and, you know, I think that the spiritual journey is uh, appropriate. So I think I mean I, I kind of think of these and I think of today as sort of you know who are you and why are you here? Um not to put pressure on here. <laughs> yeah. Um but you know I, I but I think it's a question that I I know I feel like we have asked and I know I have asked and the answer changes over time. But um <laughs> One of the things that, um, as as I think back to um, when, well, Betsy and I attended a bit over twenty years ago. We attended our first meeting with Quakers um, because that was the uh, that felt like the right place to be at that time and place, um, and I, you know. I, it was. Um, and we had um, spent some years prior to that um, wandering around, um, seeking, although I, I didn't use those words then, but that's what we were doing. Um, and um, And I came to learn over time that well, Betsy had been seeking in far off lands of um, California, while I had been seeking in far off lands of Prince George's County. Um, but really, kind of asking the same questions of, you know, who am I and why am I here? And um, welcome, Elizabeth Rush. <laughs> uh, yeah, so most people know me as Betsy, not Elizabeth, but my name is officially legally Elizabeth. Um, so I did grow up in Northern California until high school, and my seeking did start then. And I started going to um, various religious services with all of my friends and neighbors. I never really found something that felt like home. Um, I, had, I, I began with a knowledge that was mostly instinctual that there is something that I was looking for. Um, but most of the places that I went, um, what I found was people looking to someone else for the answers to the questions that I was mostly looking for inside of myself. So they were kind of ceding their individual authority to a, a human teacher in ways that did not resonate with me. So, you know, if I, if I asked lots of questions and they were uncomfortable questions, I mostly got told that's not a good question to ask. Uh, that's already been settled uh, or that's silly. Um, or let me read you a passage of the Bible and tell you what, what it means. Um, and then when I tried to say, 
how do you know that's what it means or you know which translation and how are you so sure of the translation that was not welcomed by most people so I, I spent I spent my life uh, in you know high school and um, you know some of my even even before high school really trying to find a place where my questions were welcome. Um, I spent some time playing my flute for a Jewish congregation that couldn't afford a cantor. And that maybe was kind of the closest place that I found to feeling comfortable. But then there's this like small problem with um, Jewishness specifically, which is that I'm not Jewish. And the Jewish faith tradition is very much about um, family descendancy and um, actually being ethnically Jewish. And it didn't actually speak to my condition that much. It was just kind of a friendly space where I was allowed to ask questions. Um, I tried, you know, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, um, Unitarian, Universalist, all different kinds of things. And then once we were married, we did that together. Um, and we kind of even we even had a list of places near where we lived where we, we visited. Some of them we felt more comfortable, some of them less comfortable. Um, but never a place to call home. Um, but all along I had this deep understanding that there is something unknowable that connects all of us and everything else in the world as well. Not just humans, but animals and rocks and trees and everything. Um, and I have some, still some seemingly contradictory internal understandings like that religion is man-made and therefore not perfect and also um, hurtful in many in many situations because people are using it maybe consciously maybe unconsciously um, but at the same time if there is there is a there there if um, some steps along my journey here that have been really meaningful were first of all we're coming here in the first place we um the first meeting we attended was the sunday after 9 11 and coming here had been on our list um, we hadn't gotten to it yet but um i felt and mark felt um after 9 11 very uncomfortable um, with the amount of revenge and violence talk uh, in the wake of 9-11, um, when what we could also feel from the world writ large was sympathy and love, and we could have as a nation embraced that path and mourned peacefully, but that's not what the average person that we ran into was focused on. They were, anger is a much easier, uh, stronger emotion to feel when you're hurt. And so I feel like we as a, a nation, as many people individually do, we didn't want to feel vulnerable, we wanted to feel strong and anger. Anger is a lot easier than vulnerability. So, um, but that's not what we wanted to kind of be immersed in. We wanted to be immersed in um, a desire for peace and an understanding that um, the way to healing was not to inflict hurt because you've been hurt. So we came here uh, for the first time um, with our that about nine month old. Um, 
And we've understood since that what we actually attended for our first quicker meeting was a popcorn meeting, as it's called. <laughs> Um, but it was exactly what we needed. Um, we needed to hear vulnerability and a desire for peace and forgiveness. Uh, and so we've been here ever since. Um, other things along my journey here that have been really valuable were um, being involved in circles of trust. I don't know if everyone knows what that is, so I'll describe it um, briefly, but mm -hmm. it's um, it was developed by Parker Palmer, and I encourage everyone to read, uh, especially what's called Hidden Wholeness, mm -hmm. um, one of his books. And so the, the process of a circle of trust is that you commit to meet um, periodically for a fairly long period of time and you do some reading together you have some um, very important touchstones that include deep confidentiality and not trying to fix each other um, and then the core of it is having a uh, time in which each person is the focus person they don't have to talk, but they can. And the, and everyone else there just holds the space. And um, the only thing you're allowed to do as the, the listeners is ask open, honest questions. Mm -hmm. You don't tell the person what to do. You don't help them solve their problem or uh, heal, them, heal them for them you are just present to encourage them to really listen to their own inner voice. Um, and um, we did that for a couple of years together. And um, just as a side note, when I discovered that Mark was also doing it, that made me incredibly nervous and uncomfortable because it was a different kind of vulnerability than we typically have in our marriage. I mean, we're pretty open with each other, but that's somewhat different than a situation where you are essentially allowed to bury your soul and no one's ever going to talk about it. Um, it ended up being really good for our marriage as well as for me in particular. Um, and, and I realized during that time that a lot of what I was searching for was how to bring my inner self and my outer self in alignment. Um, and prior to that, I had often felt a lot of self-judgment. Um, I felt like the real me was inadequate to the many needs of the world but I had to pretend um, that I knew what I was doing, that I was doing the right thing. Uh, and I was constantly judging myself far more harshly than I would judge anyone else in the entire world. Um, and that made me, um, actually not very good at the things that I was trying to do, which there I go, I got to judge myself, but mm -hmm. not as good as I could have been. Um, and it, so another piece of my spiritual journey has been understanding, as Mark said, who am I and what am I doing here? Um, and I realized that um especially during that that time of deep discernment in the circles of trust that I I had been devaluing my biggest assets because they were my biggest assets mm -hmm. and aspiring to be different than I was because the things that are hard for me is obviously be more valuable somehow like if I see someone who's you know, able to 
day after day do kind of extroverted things because I'm an introvert. So they're giving speeches and galvanizing thousands of people to make big change in the world. Well, that must be the most valuable thing that could be done because it's so difficult for me. Um, and so I, I tried to do things that were difficult for me um, instead of using my strengths to do things that were valuable. Um, and so over my life, I have become much, much more comfortable with the fact that who I am internally, if I can bring that out and be that person externally and use those strengths, then I will actually be who I am and be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and, and so that has reflected as well in my career path. So um, I originally tried to be a teacher. Um, and specifically a high school teacher. And I wanted to teach in really tough schools. I wanted to like be the bringer of peace and the joy of learning and, you know, magically transform hundreds of lives, you know, because I'd seen movies where people do that. <laughs> and, um, and because I did want to bring peace and transform lives, right? Um, and so there I was, um, an introvert, and uh, I found myself teaching at a school where I saw, I had 40 to 50 kids in each class, mm -hmm. six classes a day, teaching a subject that no one had any choice but to take in a school where fundamentally, um, it was considered a successful day if everybody sat still and shut up and just listened to the knowledge that the powers that be had determined were important for them to know rather than having them explore and enjoy learning. Um, you know, so just for an example, I, I taught um, local, state, and national government to ninth graders. And um, it was deemed very important, more important than like developing their own values and clarity about how they would want to vote. They had to be able to understand the difference between um, fiscal and monetary policy. You know, um, how many people in this room? <laughs> okay, yes. Um, and to be honest, I was pretty good at, at being a teacher. Um, that, that was one of my problems growing up is I'm, 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 I'm pretty capable. Once I understand a task, I'm kind of tenacious and I will figure out how I'm supposed to do it to meet the expectations of whoever hierarchically I'm supposed to please. Um, but it was killing me. Um, trying to force 45 hormonal people who, you know, didn't care about the stuff that I was trying to force them to learn. It just, it, it felt almost fascist to me. Like I had to be really mean and strict and I, I kind of like did it as kindly as I could, but that was the bottom line as I was like forcing people to learn things they didn't care about. And I know that not all teaching is like that. And perhaps if I had been in a different place, I could have found it. But in any case, I'm an introvert. Um, I notice people's feelings. So over time, I have grown into, um, instead, I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm a therapist. And I have 
through my spiritual journey, I've become able to understand another important piece of what has made me who I am, which is um, you don't help people by being in pain with them. You help people by um, validating their pain and not being overwhelmed by it and showing them that they have the internal um, <laughs> that they have everything that they need except maybe a, you know some scaffolding some support someone holding the space for them um and I don't have to tell them what they're supposed to do I don't actually do the fixing just like the circles and trust I hold the space for them so they can listen to themselves and find the resources that they need uh, internally and externally and um, become who they want to be and find peace. Um, and maybe that's where I want to stop and see if people have questions. I didn't say a lot of what I thought I was going to say because I didn't expect it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Wow. Thank you so much for what you shared. And I um I'm curious about um what's led you to uh to your leadership in the camping programs. Okay. Um so One of the one of the regrets of my life, which isn't really a regret, but gosh darn it, what if I had lived here mm. as a child and I had gotten to go to the BYM camps? <laughs> How would my um, my journey towards self acceptance and self understanding? and uh, not feeling a need to pretend to be someone other than who I am, how much earlier would my, my journey towards peace have gotten farther towards peace? I'm, I'm certainly not at peace now, but you know, I don't think any of us ever are. Um, the BYM camps, um, may have saved my one of my children's lives. I, that may be saved it too strongly, but I'm not. I'm not really sure that it is. Um, and and so I have a deep love because of that, but also. I have had the great joy of getting to go there and be a cook mm -hmm. for, you know, a dozen years now. Mm -hmm. And even as an adult who's only like tangentially involved, and I can't even say that seriously, as a cook, I was welcomed. I was not tangential. I was a part of the community. I was seen and heard and encouraged to to join in and the incredible spiritual development that happens at camp for the children and the adults is so special and it creates um, the most Quakerly Quakers that I know in my life are all people that have come through the camps. And um, so yes, leadership is not my happy place. <laughs> um, having to having to plan ahead and tell other people what's going on, not my happy place. Um, but I love the camps and the people in the camps so much that um, I really want camps to be healthy. And, and so, 
Um, the the first thing that kind of sucked me in was I went to a, a information session a long time ago um, about the need to move OPEC in from its current mm -hmm. place. I had no idea. Um, and so, and then there's actually a, a part of my skill set that that appealed to. I really like obsessively looking for the perfect something. <laughs> um, I collect like one of one my my, but well, so my one of my things that I do as I go through life is I collect ideas, I collect people, I collect resources, I um, collect useless factoids, mm -hmm. and then as I walk through my life, suddenly that useless factoid is exactly what somebody needs. Mm -hmm. And I say, I pull it out of my, my bag of, of things that I've collected, and I say, here, try this. Um, and then I, I go on my merry way, and often I see ripples from that that factoid or that piece of knowledge that I had no idea why I would need it. And so helping people find a place to live or finding the perfect property for something or finding the right modality for therapy for a particular person's issues, that's, I love doing that. So. For those who don't know, Betsy's currently clerking the campaign program committee for Walmart and Media. They did a very good job. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you again. A very simple question. I'm sure there's a very short answer. But uh, are you sure you're an introvert? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, in fact. But Okay, so a little sidebar. So introversion and extroversion are not about um, enjoying or capability of, of being able to speak to other people. It's where you get your energy from. So I am perfectly capable of teaching like I, I will happily, but don't quote me on this. Although I guess yeah. I feel like <laughs> I, if you give me enough lead time, I could teach a thousand people at once. I would figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. Ask me to do that every day, and I'm going to go home and vomit. Uh -huh. Okay, I need recharge time. I need a <laughs> lot of alone time. Um. And then, you know, when my battery is fully charged, I can be very social. <laughs> but yes, I am sure that I'm an expert. <laughs> yes. So I was wondering in your journey professionally, where you came out as a counselor, how much did you? Think about spirituality as you chose that kind of scene. Um, so it kind of all happened at once. Uh -huh. Um, so I did not go to graduate school until I was 40. Uh -huh. And prior to that time, I had never ever considered, like, I had. I had considered being a therapist in in kind of the light of, well, that's a thing I would never be. Yeah. <laughs> because I spent my earlier life really being unable to cope with other people's pain. Mm -hmm. um, I thought the way to validate someone's pain was to <laughs> feel it with them. And that if I didn't feel it with them, I wasn't really caring about them. Mm -hmm. Um, and so around the same time that I was doing the circles of trust, I was also, my children were starting school and I was really considering what do I want to do? And I went to graduate school with the intention of being 
a macro social worker, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, running programs. Mm -hmm. But I thought that if I was going to be running social work programs, I should probably know what my employees in my program were doing. So I thought I should like dabble like just get my toe wet in clinical work mm -hmm. just so I understood what other people were going through when I was trying to support them because mm -hmm. that was my vision of my role was that I would support the people doing that impossible work. And what I found was that apparently somewhere in there, I was no longer feeling the need to immerse myself in other people's pain and I was able to allow them to be who they are and feel their pain mm -hmm. themselves. Yes. And that, that and and so it, it it's kind of similar to um mm -hmm. recognizing the light within of another person um without mm -hmm. having to be in alignment with it because I understand that we all see our own little piece of the light and they may seem contradictory and that's okay. And so your light and your pain are yours and my light and my pain are mine, but we're, we're accompanying each other. Yeah. And I think that what you just described for wanting to know how to support other social workers answers my question. I'm fascinated that you are uh, at your ability to analyze your thoughts and so on. Uh, fascinating. And I, uh, but you brought up being at camp. Yes. And I spent 14 years working at camp too, two weeks every summer. My wife has always said that the reason our children are Quakers is because of camp. And but when I, I'm not an analytical person, and I often wonder what it is at camp that is so magical for so many people. What, 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 are, what you thought about? What do you think it is at camp that is, uh, creates such, uh, uh, make, makes children grow into social? So the first piece is impossible to replicate in the outside world, which is that everybody knows that you're only there for a limited amount of time. And so everybody can suspend their regular way of being for a limited amount of time and focus on accepting and loving each other. I say that because I know that we're all trying to do that in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and and various at various times, various groups of people have attempted to make that their permanent way of life. And, so, and in a very few situations, I think that probably works really well. But I think humans tend towards um, defense mechanisms and um, the clutter of day-to-day -day life. So in the in the real world, you know, the, well, I shouldn't really call it the real world. Camp is real too. Mm -hmm. Camp is very real, but it's temporary. Um, and it's intentional. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to be intentional for, a short amount of time, easier. Um, but the other thing is the amount of behind the scenes, intense labor, emotional and physical that the staff does is superhuman. Mm -hmm. um, and they really talk out their responses and um, and if we could, if we could, for example, staff school in such a way that that the people working with each individual child had time to meet every other day and talk about, well, how are we going to handle this issue that's come up about that child? Um, 
school can be way more like camp. Uh -huh. um, but that's not how we have chosen as a society to um, structure our resources. Uh, understandably, because, you know, there's a lot more to life. Than, yeah. Um, and so we have, you know, going back to when I, you know, I had, if I just knew the names of all of the 200 children that I saw every day in, in within like a couple weeks, that was an accomplishment. Um, so you have to know a child to really teach them. And we don't, on average, know our children. I'm not, I mean, like, we know our individual children, but we send them to school or we, you know, whatever. And we don't, we don't know them. We think we know what they should know. And so we throw it at them. And then they become adults who were never known and maybe don't know themselves and don't feel comfortable um, being who they are. And so it goes. So folks, we need to bring the Zoom portion of this to a close. But thank you, Betsy. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.